Well, good morning and welcome to the fourth session of our Lent course. Moving on this week, another 70 years or so from Cyprian into the early fourth century to one of the foremost theologians of the early church, a man named Athanasius. And his name literally means the immortal one. Imagine being called that, the immortal. That's what Athanasius means. And he was born around the year 298. He became embroiled in one of the fiercest theological debates of the early church. And this might make you think he'll be rather boring, because we tend these days not to be very interested in theology and theological debates. We can struggle to see the relevance for everyday life. But I hope that we'll see today that Athanasius' passion was not for academic points of theological minutiae, but for the very heart of the Christian faith, for what makes the gospel truly good news. But that does mean today we're going to be getting into a bit more uh, theology today. And I'm going to do my very best to explain things clearly and simply so we can get, um, all get an idea of what the debate was all about and why it was so important. And why in Athanasius' view, the views he was opposing robbed Christianity of its very heart. But as I've said in previous weeks, if at any point I'm going over your heads, do, do uh, interrupt and ask me to try and clarify further. I'll do my best to do so. So, just to begin with, an introduction to Athanasius. Athanasius grew up through what has become known as the Great Persecution, unleashed by the Emperor Diocletian and reaching its height in the year 303. The Great Persecution was the most targeted and brutal persecution of Christians that had yet been seen. Oh, and I've got a picture of a photo there of Emperor Diocletian. Uh, Christian gatherings were prohibited, holy texts and church buildings were destroyed, and all Christian clergy were arrested and imprisoned. But just 10 years later, another emperor, who'd recently extended his control over the Roman Empire, Emperor Constantine, issued the Edict of Milan of 313, which for the first time officially granted freedom of worship to Christians. So in just the space of 10 years, you go from the fiercest persecution yet unleashed against Christians to freedom of worship being um, granted. While there's been much debate about the nature of Constantine's own personal faith, he did increasingly favor and privilege Christians and Christianity, and he passed a number of laws in line with Christian teaching, such as the banning of gladiatorial games and the recognition of Sunday as a holiday. So our weekly pattern dates back from Constantine. This all meant that in practice, Christianity had almost overnight gone from being a persecuted minority to being more or less the official religion of the Roman Empire. So this was the world in which Athanasius was growing up. We know little of his background, other than that he was born in Alexandria, which is the, over there, it's the capital of the Roman province of Egypt, and one of the foremost cities of the empire. With the great library of Alexandria, it was a cultural and intellectual hub, the Oxford of its day. Not Cambridge, but Oxford. <laughs> While still a relatively uh, young man, he was appointed by Alexander, the well-named bishop of Alexandria, as his assistant, and had him ordained deacon in 319, when he would have been only around 20 years old. It was around this same time that a certain priest in Alexandria called Arius began to oppose the teaching of Bishop Alexander. Arius taught that Jesus was not truly God. And this led to what has become known as the Arian Controversy, 
is a controversy that Athanasius would find himself at the forefront of for the rest of his life, especially after the year 328, when he was consecrated bishop of Alexandria following Alexander's death. Athanasius was a fiery character with a sharp intellect, and on becoming bishop, he effectively became the leader of those advocating for the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. He was a colorful character and led a very colorful life. He was sent into exile no fewer than five times as succeeding emperors came down on different sides of the Arian debate. Just to give you a sense of the man, his quick wittedness and the sort of life he lived, I want to share a story with you from later on in his life during his fourth exile under the Emperor Julian. Julian the Apostate, as he's become known. He was the last pagan emperor of Rome. Julian didn't persecute Christians as such, um, but he did seek to re-establish paganism as the preferred religion of the empire. And so Julian didn't really have much interest in these theological debates that were raging, and he saw Athanasius as really more of a troublemaker and just wanted to get rid of him. So he sent him into exile, but then changed his mind and sent troops after him to execute him. Athanasius had boarded a boat and was heading up the Nile upstream. The imperial troops were following in a much faster boat, and before long were gaining on Athanasius. This is the Roman equivalent of a Bond-style boat chase. And so Athanasius, quick thinking, instructed that the boat be turned around. And everyone on the boat is thinking, what are you doing? You're crazy. He's gonna, they're going to catch you. But they turn the boat around, and they soon come alongside the imperial troops coming in the opposite direction. Have you seen Athanasius? comes the cry. Is he close by? And Athanasius himself calls back. Yes, he is very close. Keep going. And off they go in pursuit, while Athanasius sneaks back into Alexandria and goes off into hiding. So that's just a bit of a sense of the character of Athanasius, the sort of guy he was. Well, let's turn now then to the theology itself of the Arian controversy that he was so involved in. But before we do, I want to backtrack a little and to put Arius' views into context to see where the whole theology around the Trinity comes from. And I'm going to give you some work to begin with. So thinking uh, what, about the Bible, what passages of the Bible can you think of that speak of Jesus in some way as God? What passages of the Bible can you think of that speak of Jesus in some way as God? And what problem can you see that they create? Okay? Turn to your neighbours and have a think about those questions for a few minutes. As we've seen, there are lots of passages that speak about Jesus as God. And indeed, the practice from the early church, as far as we can tell, was that Christians worshipped and prayed to Jesus as God. But the problem is that Jesus also prayed to his heavenly Father and spoke about him and the Holy Spirit as someone else. Does that mean we have two or three gods? Well, that can't be right either, because Christianity was a Jewish religion, and the heart of Jewish teaching is the Shema, um, the words from Deuteronomy 6 I've put down there on your handout. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we have a commitment to God being one, but also Jesus being spoken of and treated as also God, but different from the Father. How do we hold these together? How do we say that God is both one, and yet Jesus and the Holy Spirit are also God? And this is, as Les was saying, this is essentially the, the problem, if you like, of the Trinity. In the century before Arius, there had been two um, 
attempts to resolve this tension, to get rid of the Trinity, both of which were ultimately rejected as not satisfactory. One was adoptionism, which was advocated especially by someone called Paul of Samosata. Adoptionism states that only the Father is truly God, and Jesus was adopted as the Son of God, and given, as it were, divine status at his baptism. So that moment at his baptism, as we heard, where the voice declares, you are my son, the beloved, the adoptionist would say, well, it was at that point that Jesus was kind of taken on by God the Father as his special son and given some sort of elevated status. So Jesus isn't truly God, but was simply adopted as the son of God. A similar theology lives on today in Unitarianism, um, the, the idea that God is one and Jesus is in some ways um, just adopted as God's son. The problem with these views is that we're left with a Jesus who's not really divine, he's not really God, just an ordinary person who's been adopted or inspired in some ways by God, which doesn't fit with what we've seen of the biblical witness to the deity of Christ. So adoptionism is rejected. The other attempt that was rejected is what's called modalism. And this was particularly associated with someone called Sabellius. Modalism states that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are different modes, different forms of the one same God. So there are not three separate persons, but one God who sometimes wears the Father hat, sometimes the Son hat, and sometimes the spirit hat. One God who we see playing different roles. And so the problem with modalism is that it doesn't really do justice to the distinctions we see between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We cannot really speak of the Father loving the Son if there's just one person playing different roles. I cannot speak of myself as curate loving um, the husband of Stephanie because I'm the same person. So modalism was also rejected. Unfortunately, modalism does unintentionally live on uh, today. Um, think of the common analogy people often use for the Trinity of water, ice, and vapor. Well, that's just modalism. That's one thing, H2O, existing in three different forms, water, ice, or vapor. Like if you uh, cool God down a bit, he becomes the... Uh, the, the sun, if you heat him up a bit, he becomes the spirit. In fact, every analogy of the Trinity is defective in some way. And we have to be very careful with analogies of the Trinity not to create false ideas of who God is. So if someone gives you an analogy of the Trinity, this is what the Trinity is like, do you think about it? Is it really actually expressing the threeness and the oneness of God? That God is three persons, but one God. So, modalism and adoptionism were two ways, two attempts to try and tidy up the confusing relationship between God and Jesus, but both of them were rejected. And this then brings us to Arius, this gentleman. Obviously, Arius wasn't popular after his death, so um, pictures of him not maybe the most flattering. When the Arian controversy broke out, Arius was a well-established priest in the Church of Alexandria, probably in around his late 50s. Very little of his own writings have survived, either being later destroyed or simply not preserved by later generations who saw them as heretical. So it can be hard to know precisely what he did say um, and why he said it. But from the evidence we have, it seems likely that he was seeking to make Christianity more acceptable, more understandable to the Roman intellectual elite. After all, we remember that Alexandria was one of the great intellectual centers of the ancient world. The Library of Alexandria is one of the largest libraries ever to have existed at that time. And what it seems Arius was trying to do was to speak about the Christian God 
using a philosophical understanding of God that would have been widely held at the time. So probably in very similar ways to the rationalists of the Enlightenment, um, Aris was trying to make Christian theology more intellectually acceptable to the thinkers and philosophers of his day. What do I mean by that? Well, his basic position was to say that Jesus was not God, but was the foremost, the first of God's creations. The Father alone is God, and he created Jesus, his word, and then through Jesus created everything else. It's the sort of theology we see in the Jehovah's Witnesses today. They also believe that Jesus is not God, but simply the foremost of God's creations. And Arius was very successful at promoting this theology. He liked teaching people little jingles to um, help embed his ideas. Uh, one of those jingles is one that Athanasius would go on to tear apart. And have I put it down on the... Yes, I put it down on the handout. There once when the sun was not. It was probably catchier in the, uh, in the original Greek. In other words, because the sun was created by the Father, before he was created, he was not. He didn't exist. So there was a time when the Son was not, when the Father was just by himself. So that's what the jingle means. There, there once was a time when the Son was not. And his people would go around singing this jingle around the streets. Now, Arius got to this point by beginning with a contemporary philosophical understanding of God. In contemporary philosophy, God was understood as the being who was the origin of all things. Therefore, God himself did not and could not have an origin. God was unoriginate. Sounds good, doesn't it? That's what we think, do we not? God is the origin of all things. He's the creator of all things. But the problem was that Arius took this idea as fundamental to who God is. It was the premise from which he began in trying to understand God. But if you begin here, it means that Arius had to conclude that Jesus couldn't be divine. For if God is unoriginate, then the Son cannot be God, because a Son, by definition, has an origin in a father or mother. A son, by definition, is the son of someone. It's a relational, dependent term. A son has to be the son of someone, otherwise they wouldn't be a son. So if the son has his origin in the father, then it means that the son cannot be God, because God doesn't have an origin. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Sort of. So because Arius begins from the premise that God doesn't have an origin, the son cannot be God, because the son, by definition, has to have an origin. A son is the son of someone. So instead, Arius argued that the son was created by the father at the beginning of all time as the foremost of his creation, but nonetheless was still a created being. And so... There once was a time when the Son was not. And the Son is not truly God. Oh, deep breath. Let's take a pause here. As I said at the start, this can all sometimes feel like abstruse and academic theology with little relevance to everyday life. But at the time, it became a major debate, and not just among church leaders. As I said, Arius pop popularized his theology through his jingles, and uh, you'd get choirs. Uh, rival choirs are going around the streets singing um, Arian and Orthodox theology, trying to outsing each other. And 50 or 60 years later, another bishop in what is today Turkey, Gregory of Nyssa, um, he would write that if you went to the local shop or to the bakery or to the bathhouse, well, everyone would be reciting Arian slogans. You ask for your slice of if your loaf of um, King's Mill and you'd be given an Aryan slogan in response. At the time, it was a major debate that everyone, it seems, was talking about. And it's also relevant for us still today. 
The debates led to the creation of many of our creeds, and we'll look at one of them later on, which we recite week by week in church. Also, one of our Christmas carols. Anyone know which Christmas carol I'm referring to? Maureen? I wondered if someone might say that one. Kind of. It's not quite the one I was thinking of. Any other guesses? There's one that's more... Maybe it will come clearer as we go through. You'll get a prize later on if you guess it. And of course, it's the heart, as I said, of Christian uh, theology. So let's. So the legacy very much of this debate is still felt today. So let's just pause and talk to someone near you and ask yourselves the question, why, what was so wrong with Aris's theology? Why is this all such a big deal? Why was, what was wrong with Aris's theology and why? And do ask as I go around if anything is unclear that you'd like me to unpack further. So turn to someone near you. What was wrong with Aris's theology and why? I think there are four key implications um, that Athanasius particularly drew attention to uh, for the gospel. First is that a creature cannot truly reveal God. A really important question for us is how can we know God? Not just know things about him, but actually know him. Many religious teachers down the ages have um, taught what they think about God. Some have claimed to have had a direct revelation from God. But Jesus claimed that in meeting him, you were meeting God himself. Whoever has seen me, he said, has seen the Father. If you've seen me, he's saying, you've seen God. But if Jesus were just a creature, such expressions are utter madness. Jesus could not say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, unless he was God incarnate, God present with us in human form. Athanasius wrote um, a wonderful book, which I meant to bring with me, uh, called On the Incarnation, all about the word of God, Jesus, becoming flesh. And he writes this. This is over the page on the back of your handout. He writes this. Men had turned from the contemplation of God above and were looking for him in the opposite direction, down among created things and things of sense. That is, people had turned from the worship of God to, uh, to the worship of created things. The saviour of us all, the word of God, in his great love, took to himself a body and moved as man among men, meeting their senses, so to speak, halfway. So he's saying that people are already looking for God among created things. So in love, God becomes a created thing himself to give himself to us. He became himself an object for the senses, so that those who are seeking God in sensible things, that is, in things that you can sense by touch, taste, sight, might apprehend the Father through the works which he, the word of God, did in the body. So because Jesus was God come in the flesh, in Jesus we truly meet God. We see what he's like. We see his authority, his power, his love, his tenderness, his anger, injustice, and so on. In Jesus we truly see God. Indeed, we meet God himself. But Arius' is Jesus, being just a creature, takes us no further to actually knowing God. Arius' is Jesus cannot really show us what God was like, and we're left to come up with our own ideas about him. For example, that God is unoriginate as his key identity. That's the first one. Second one, a creature should not be worshipped. Well, from the beginning, as I said, it had been the practice of Christians to worship and pray to Jesus. We see this even in the New Testament. Think of doubting Thomas. And when he sees the risen Lord, he exclaims, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't correct him. The Apostle Paul prays to the Father and to the Lord Jesus. For example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he prays, 
may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord, probably meaning Jesus, make you increase and abound in love. But the scriptures are also very clear that worship and prayer belong to God alone. So if Jesus isn't God, then he shouldn't be being worshipped. As Athanasius himself argues, and this is the second passage, and, and this is a translation by John Henry Newman, so quite old, um, so excuse the old language. Creature does not worship creature, but servant Lord and creature God. Thus Peter the apostle hinders Cornelius who would worship him, saying, I myself also am a man. And an angel, when John would worship him in the Apocalypse in Revelation, hinders him, saying, See thou do it not, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of them that keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Therefore to God alone appertains worship. And then he goes on to describe some of the passages where Jesus is worshipped in Scripture. And he continues... But he had not been thus worshipped, nor been thus spoken of, were he a creature merely. But now, since he is not a creature, but the proper offspring of the essence of that God who is worshipped, and his son by nature, therefore he is worshipped and is believed to be God. In other words, because Jesus himself is God, and not a creature, therefore it's quite proper to worship him as such. By offering worship to Jesus, the church was already in practice treating Jesus as divine. And so to claim that Jesus were just a creature would mean to reshape the church's established liturgy, practice, and worship. So, a creature should not be worshipped. Eris was calling into question what the church was already doing. Thirdly, a creature cannot save. And this is the point that a number of you basically came up with. The Bible teaches, and human experience attests, that all is far from well with the world. Romans 8 speaks of the whole creation groaning. We're in a mess, a mess of sin, and we need saving. All have sinned, Paul says, and fall short of the glory of God. But Athanasius says that if Jesus is part of, just a part of God's creation, then he's in no position to help, because he too would be in need of saving. Um, he writes, I didn't think I know, I didn't put this one down. He writes, if he were a creature, he too would be one of those who groan with the rest of creation, and who would, and who would, need, and would need one who should bring adoption and deliverance to himself, as well as others. As we were saying, he would just be a man a tragic man dying on a cross. Furthermore, if we were originally made in God's image, and that image was marred when we turned away from and disobeyed God, it was only God himself who can restore us into God's image. And back to on the incarnation, Athanasius asks this. This is the next passage on the handout. How could this, that's the renewing of God's image in mankind, how could this be done? Save by the coming of the very image himself, our saviour, Jesus Christ. Men could not have done it, for they are only made after the image. Nor could angels have done it, for they are not the images of God. The word of God came in his own person, because it was he alone, the image of capital I image of the Father, who could recreate man made after the image. In other words, because our very nature as humans made after the image of God had been ruined by our sin and disobedience, what was required was nothing less than the image itself, the Son of the Father, to take on human form and recreate humanity anew. It was this argument on the issue of salvation that was Athanasius' main argument against the Arians. His principal theological standpoint was that in Christ, God was made man, that we might be made divine sons and daughters of God. In his understanding, 
it was essential that Christ was both fully divine and fully human to make salvation of sinful mankind possible, to restore fallen humanity to the image of God and to relationship with God. Aris's theology rendered Jesus an ineffective agent of salvation. If Jesus is merely a creature, then he cannot save. So that's the third point, a creature cannot save. And then fourthly and finally, God without the Son is not a father. We were saying before that the Son is by definition son of someone. Well, the same in reverse is true of the father. I cannot say that I'm a father because I don't have any children. I made you one day, but I don't at the moment, so I'm not a father. Likewise, if there was a time when the son was not, then there was a time when the father was not a father. The father couldn't be said to have been the father when there wasn't a son any more than I can be called a father, regardless of whether or not I have children at some point in the future. And so that means, that would mean that God's fundamental identity is not a father. He became a father at some point later on, or maybe he got bored with being on his own. Rather, he is, as the Arians called him, or he would be in their theology, the unoriginate, the one without cause or origin. That's, according to them, his key identity. But do you see how suddenly differently God appears if he's termed unoriginate? We may not all have had good fathers. Some of our fathers may have been very far from good. But in, in its ideal form, the term father is a personal, relational term. The term unoriginate is empty of any personality or love. Athanasius remarks, and this is the bottom of that uh, final um, passage on your handout, that Jesus taught us to pray not, O oh God, unoriginate, but the much more tender, our Father, inviting us to share in his relationship of sonship with the Father. Just think of the difference it makes to your spirituality. If you go home today and you begin your prayer, O oh God, unoriginate, compared to if you go back and say, my father. It's very different, isn't it? So the problem with the Arians is that they were trying to understand God simply from his works. That is, he created things, therefore he is the creator, the first cause. That's who God fundamentally is, the creator, the unoriginate. But Athanasius argued, we need to instead begin from Jesus, who is the revelation of God. If we begin with Jesus the Son, then God becomes not fundamentally the unoriginate, but the Father, the one who was Father from all eternity, living in relationship of love with his Son and the Holy Spirit, and who created all things, not because he was bored one day, but as an overflow of that love. It's only a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who can truly be said to be love, because love requires relationship. If God unoriginate was just all by himself from all eternity, he would have no one to love apart from himself. And that would mean a very self-centered and unappealing God, not the God we see revealed in Jesus Christ. So these few reasons are why the Trinity was not for Athanasius some abstruse doctrine for the academic theologians. It's the very heart of the gospel. In contrast to Arianism, Orthodox Trinitarianism teaches that in Jesus, we can truly know God, we can be truly saved from our sins, and perhaps most of all, brought into the Trinity's relationship of love, adopted as sons and daughters of the Father. We're given the same status as the Son of God himself. Any questions at that point?
the Spirit. Yes, yeah, so the Holy Spirit doesn't, he doesn't feature much in the original Arian debates, but later on, particularly with people like um, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil of Caesarea, they become much more interested in the Spirit's role in the Trinity. Um, but you do have that passage in the, um, the farewell discourse, so John um, 13 to 17, in the upper room, um, where Jesus speaks of sending another comforter who would come to be with his people, referring to the Spirit. So there Jesus is referring to the Spirit as, as again, a separate person from himself. And so that's where you get the beginnings of um, the idea of the Holy Spirit as a person. But yes, at this stage, it focuses more on Jesus' status than the Holy Spirit. Les? Would you agree that it sort of Well, we're going to come on to the creed in a moment, so hold that question and that thought, and we'll come on to the creed in just a moment. Well, let, let's, shall we actually, let's turn there now, shall we? Um, so, there were times for Athanasius when he seemed to be the only real voice for Trinitarian orthodoxy, and at the low point... Um, of his career, he's supposed to have said, if the whole world is against the truth, then Athanasius is against the world, which led to the Latin phrase, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. Convinced that a Jesus who was not divine could not save and could not bring us to the Father, he did not relent, despite all he faced, from continuing to contend for the heart of the Christian gospel and how we're grateful to him for his labours today. It's something of an irony, given all that he went through during his five exiles and his many years as bishop, that the controversy was supposed to have been settled early on in his life, even before he became bishop. The Emperor Constantine, wanting to resolve the arguments once and for all, called the Council of Nicaea, in the year 325. And this was the first major council of church leaders from across the Roman Empire. They met in the town of Nicaea in Asia Minor, near to his royal palace, so he didn't have too far to go. After many hours of vigorous debate, the council produced an early form of what we now know as the Nicene Creed. It did get slightly amended a bit later on. This was an articulation of orthodox Trinitarian theology. It's the creed we recite nearly every Sunday, or nearly every communion uh, service here at St. Andrews. It's only our um, Lent and Advent purple books that for some reason have a different creed. Not quite such a good one, I don't think, personally. Um, but all the other books have the Nicene Creed in them. It was this creed that Athanasius was defending throughout his life. It was only in 381, just a few years after his death, that the second ecumenical council at Constantinople reaffirmed the creed and, in a sense, put the debates more or less to bed um, once and for all. So as we draw to a close, I want us to, to take a look at the Nicene Creed. Given all that we've seen this morning of the debates between Arius and Athanasius, can you see which parts of the Nicene Creed are particularly responding to those debates? And what do you think those bits are trying to say? What do, what do they mean? Why are they there? So turn to those around you and have a look at the creed together. Um, but just having a look quickly then at those, at that. So really the key bit in the Nicene Creed um, for uh, uh, opposing Arian theology is that uh, the first half of that second paragraph. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. And each phrase there is carefully constructed 
to refute Aris' theology. The Son of God is eternally begotten of the Father. There wasn't a moment when the Father decided to beget the Son to have a Son. Rather, from all eternity, the Father and the Son existed together in relationship. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. All these phrases underline that, yes, Jesus may have his origin as the Son of, in the Father, but he's just as much God as the Father is. He's true God from true God, which may spark um, thoughts about which Christmas carol I was referring to earlier on. Nope, not Hark the Herald. O come all ye faithful. The second verse, God of God, light of light. <clears throat> um, verily, uh, was it, um, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, verily begotten. Very God, begotten, not created. Yes, thank you. Basically, putting the Nicene Creed to music. Um, then you've got begotten, not made. So, yes, that idea that Aris argued that Jesus was made or created by the Father, rather than using this biblical word beget to express the relationship between a father and a son. And then of one being with the Father. is actually a phrase that caused an awful lot of um, uh, disagreement um, at the time. Um, it's, it's one word in Greek, this long word, homoousios. Um, so homo, meaning uh, same, and then ousios, meaning um, being. So it means of one being. Um, but others kind of wanted to find a compromise with Arians, didn't quite like that, it was a bit too strong, so they wanted to go for homoousios, which means of like being. So homoi, meaning like, rather than the same. Um, but if Jesus is just like God, well, either he's another God, and so we've got the problem of having two gods, or he's like in some other way and is not God. Either way, we don't have the Trinity. Um, and so eventually homoi usios was rejected. And this is perhaps a good place to draw things to a close. It, it, it's been said that that single iota, um, uh, which caused so much debate and argument, was, was um, not theological hair-splitting, but it signified the difference between a Jesus who saves and a Jesus who can't. A Jesus who is the divine Son of God, who for us and for our salvation was made man and a Jesus who would have no power and ability to do anything at all to restore our fallen human nature. The difference between a Jesus who can offer us real hope and a Jesus who can offer us none at all. It is for this gospel, this glorious good news, that Athanasius, using his sharp, powerful intellect, passionately argued throughout his life. And that's why we rec recite these words week by week, so that the church may never again forget, as it did for a brief time in Athanasius' lifetime, um, the gospel of our salvation, the gospel of God made man, so that we might be restored to God. And with that, shall I say a prayer as we close. And I thought I'd pray the collect for Trinity Sunday seemed appropriate. So let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defended from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>